Hello, beautiful humans. Thank you for joining me on a episode here on Creative Street. Today, I have with me Varun Vasan, who is a former certified peer specialist for the state of Hor- of Ho- eh, sorry guys for the state of Ohio, who was working uh, in the behavioral behavioral health field, specifically with people in recovery. Thank you for joining us, Varun. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Um. So- Yes. Like, uh, so uh, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself um, and your work? Uh, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So um, I do. I have a show myself, so I, I get it. Sometimes you, you trip over your words. Uh, so no, no worries there. Uh, I, I must uh, a re- former certified peer specialist, which that's just a bunch of fancy words for I worked in the behavioral health field with people in recovery. Um, and in order to have such a role, I have to have lived experience myself, which means that I am in, in recovery myself. And I am now pushing six years in recovery. And with that comes a lot of a lot of challenges and perseverance. And it's that perseverance that is so overwhelming to somebody early in recovery because they just cannot see themselves making it that far along and a certified peer specialist um it's their job to 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 be the role model and show that this is the way that it can be done and uh just it's really an odd role also just because you have to be yourself. That's like, that's the role Uh, as this is one of the easiest roles. You just be yourself, but where it becomes hard is, is translating your experience to another person's perspective. And that's, that's hard. So with that, and then uh, I, when I say former, meaning um, I have since left the field for just, uh, call it creative differences, professional differences. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I, I want to continue that work. So I started a show. I, I, I've started a community and I intend to continue that work through what I do online. Gotcha. That that sounds like a very intense journey, um, but very meaningful and impactful work for sure. Like connecting with those individuals and kind of showing them there is there is a light at the end of the tunnel type of thing. Oh, for um, sure. <clears throat> what was the addiction journey like for you? Uh, brutal. Intense is a good word. Uh, 15 years roughly since I I first experimented with drugs and alcohol and then about 10 years of active opioid heroin addiction and luckily I got out right at the ass end of it right before everything became fentanyl because Mm -hmm. that is a whole different beast Mm -hmm. it's the same concept just it's like boss mode it's like uh you know if anybody's familiar with dragon ball z it's like it's like final form heroin to fentanyl it's it's next level uh yeah so it you know overcoming all of that over over it took me 10 years it took me 10 years to really find the the exit you know the exit ramp and uh so many so many challenges stood in the way that had to be overcome and and some some battles that i'm still fighting today you know six years later in six years it seems like a long time but i bet like compared to that journey that you've gone through and all those experiences it's nothing it's like a drop in the bucket It, it is yeah um what were like when did you realize that it was like time for a change like in your life um there 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 was a couple of different sort of checkpoints mm-hmm. where i i first knew i wanted to be done as like the the first couple times i noticed that i was dope sick you know that was the first like okay this can't be forever um and then 
really, really once once you're homeless and and things are really upside down, you're you're committing crimes, you're you're doing things that you would not do uh sober, you know. So so my first uh time in and out of rehab was really when I just, you know, realized I, I had to change. And that's really when I began to change. I, I started with things like small realistic promises to myself such as no more being grimy uh to like because it's it's a cutthroat lifestyle you mm -hmm. know living and being acquainted with other dope heads and you know i promised myself i would stop being grimy to other dope heads and, and as <laughs> obvious as that sounds to like outside listeners, people who are familiar with the lifestyle would understand what I mean, because you you do what you got to do. And I, I first promised myself, like, no, I'm going to stop being grimy. I'm going to stop, you know, doing dirty things just to get high. And mm -hmm. that was the first step. And then it was I'm going to stop stealing because I used to I used to steal from the stores and mm -hmm boost as they call it and and uh use that to fund my my habits mm -hmm. i got to a point where i told myself i was no longer going to if i couldn't support my habit out of my own bank account mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't need to get high I, I didn't deserve it i didn't yeah so i i started with little promises like that to myself and i i found a way to make it possible you know and it really just shows you that you create the reality you want and so it, you know that was the beginning of it and then I just slowly tweaked it over time until I you know like I said I'm still fighting some battles today <laughs> really it comes down to I have a problem with bad habits is really what it comes down to mm -hmm. and uh, just finding a way to to live with good habits mm -hmm. yeah I mean that takes a lot of mental like fortitude and strength to be able to like just change a bad habit into something that maybe not be a great habit but definitely less detrimental <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> um during all of that like did you ever have like a creative outlet or something something that helped you keep yourself grounded like how did you keep yourself grounded through most of it at least like early on uh no I, I didn't and it was very frustrating um i'm i'm a very creative person and always really have been mm -hmm. and i really found that chasing drugs like that chasing that high it douses those flames so um i i first i i made a friend which that was also sort of on my recovery journey one of the things that like really led me to my exit ramp was uh, I, I did actually make a friend which really changed the game for me because I thought there was no such thing as friendship in adulthood you know I mm -hmm. was just, you know I can barely trust myself how can I trust other people but uh, I made a friend we had a lot of similar interests we actually had a lot of like we actually knew each other before we knew each other and we didn't know it kind of thing uh, a lot of mutual friends and such mm -hmm. and um we just clicked and we became brothers um and we started to he he was more of a musician i'm more of a writer so i did write here and there poetry and just like little little things to express myself affirmations and stuff um i was never completely cut off from my creativity but it was just few and far between and then when i made friends with with uh with james was his name i you know, it was a completely different game. Like it was, it was so relieving and so much of my, my stressors were, were addressed in this manner because it, it also made it easy when I started doing these little tweaks and I started to, to uh, slowly find my way to that exit ramp, having a friend and being able to be creative in such a way made it easier, you know? So, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, finding support and connection in that is like, is super important. 
you say was he are you no longer friends with james um oh well uh 2017 is my my rock bottom year i use that term loosely i don't believe in the traditional version of what a what, what rock bottom the rock bottom always gets deeper is my point mm -hmm. but nonetheless 2017 was my my rock bottom year um that was the year that i that if this six years ago um that's the year that everything changed and uh and within a six week period uh he overdosed and died and my mother went into a diabetic coma within six weeks of one another and they were both those two were the only rocks that i had in my life and uh within six weeks they were both gone and uh it was dramatic very drastic so i can't imagine how tough that might have that like that was i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i appreciate um, it so like have you like have you still had moments where you find yourself like still wanting to go back to that type of lifestyle or i, I know you mentioned you still have those bad habits mm. but like has it ever been to like that point of like i i want to go back there or like it's better to be back there like i don't know so what you're talking about are like triggers and cravings mm -hmm. and and triggers and cravings will always be there like you can mm -hmm. ask somebody who has been a lifetime smoker and quit smoking they're just always there they're always going to be there you eat a good meal and you're like oh i wish i could have a cigarette or mm -hmm. after you know good sex and you're like oh, i wish i had a cigarette those are great mm -hmm. times for cigarettes um but <laughs> You know, but just like cigarettes, you know, heroin has those those ties to my nostalgia, to different things. And sometimes it's just like, man, I miss that. What I don't miss is the lifestyle. What mm -hmm. I don't miss are the the days feeling miserable and just, you know, out of all the days spent chasing that drug, maybe... 15% of it were actually enjoyable you know what I mean like yeah. whereas most of the days I was miserable feeling sorry for myself or dope sick or one way or the other um it was very you know and it became less enjoyable over time as well mm -hmm. like every time every day just became less and less enjoyable so no on one hand I do not miss it at all mm -hmm. um but there's moments where my brain entertains the idea so it's hard it's definitely hard so you've mentioned dope sick like twice now and i'm sorry i don't know what that means like oh my apologies uh <laughs> it's just a street term for withdrawal symptoms mm, um okay it's the it's the version of sick that you are when it's self-induced from drug use and then lack of those drugs gotcha so, yeah ah, okay i <laughs> sorry <laughs> no you're good you're good um so what's your current outlet i'm like is the podcasting the vlogging is that like your current creative outlet or do you have other other outlets yeah. as well that's the main outlet um I'm, I'm building this brand uh that essentially is focused around creativity uh, it's mm -hmm. called Vagabard. It's me smashing two of my favorite words together. And, you know, that's for the creative wandering spirit within us all. The Vagabard is the storyteller within us. The Vagabard is the person that, you know, leads that kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So um, I've started that brand by doing a podcast and I have a website under construction at the moment where there will be a blog and you know i'll be able to link it to my my uh my podcast and i'm going to have other videos i do and stuff as well so it's just the beginning of a, of a much bigger concept so for now yes that is my main outlet but i also have a lot of other little tinier projects underneath that that umbrella one of them being 
um, the story that I started when um, James and I, because James is ultimately responsible for, for me walking down that creative path because I made a friend in a mm-hmm. time where I thought friends were not possible. And because that friend had such strong similarities and we, we had such shared interests um, he was more of a musician you know, I can play a guitar if you show me a chord or two, but he writes music and he was able to play every instrument. He was just, yeah, next level. So mm-hmm. he he wrote the, a lot of the music and I wrote a lot of the, the lore behind the lyrics and stuff. And um, together we created this fictional, um, this fictional world and this fictional story. And uh, I have since expanded on that story and, um, it's led me down this path of creativity. So I sort of owe it to him being the genesis of it all and very much intend on um, expanding that story on the blog as well. So there will be articles, there will be opinion pieces, but there's also going to be fiction and like web comics and things like that. So that sounds so cool. And I, I love that it's like paying tribute to yours and his relationship The you know, he's no longer with us, but He's made this like everlasting like impact on you, um, and Absolutely. and you know, and I love that you you continued that like for your relationship. Sorry, I'm a little sappy, so like I'm <laughs> I'm starting oh, to I see mean, off. I, I like it. that's very touching. It's it's very rare that we find like a kindred soul, like in our lifetimes, and like especially making a friend during that challenging time in your life, like. Yeah. You wouldn't be here speaking with me if if his influence hadn't been there, if you hadn't made that connection with him. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, that's um, very, very true. <laughs> like, along the way, aside from, um, you know, your recovery, what other challenges have, like, you you faced um, aside from, like, the loss of James and, and you know, all of those the challenges that come with the recovery. Okay. Well, I mean, so you first have the, the withdrawal symptoms themselves. You got to make it through that, which is very difficult. Um, you had said something a few minutes ago and uh, I was going to circle back and almost forgot, but it, it, it's, there's this thing called harm reduction, which when I started to work into the field, uh, I'm a firm believer in and mm-hmm. harm reduction is simply just um managing your recovery in a way that it's the, it's the answer to abstinence because aa na 12 step programs they're very much abstinence based faith based abstinence based and that turns off a lot of people mm-hmm. and there's this other thing called harm reduction which me as a peer specialist if you were somebody that was struggling and you were like Uh, I drink a lot of alcohol. I drink about a bottle a night, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, you want to get better? Yes, I do. Okay, well, what are we going to do? Well, I can't see myself quitting right now. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, I think maybe I'll just drink a half a bottle a night. Okay, let's start there. And then the next time I meet up with you, how you doing on that goal? Well, I've been drinking a half bottle a night. All right, I'm going to drink. I'm going to I'm going to take it down to maybe just, uh, you know, a few shots. All right, let's do that. And that's harm reduction. That's 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 approaching it in a way that is realistic. And that's the path I took. And for me, it was a lot easier to overcome the, the withdrawal symptoms in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so besides the withdrawal symptoms, I, I had my mother who uh, went into a diabetic coma. We at times thought she was she was going to be gone as well. She pulled through, um, suffered some brain damage. She's in a, in a home now, but she survived Mm -hmm. and she's still a little bit, you know, she, she has some recovery herself left, but, um, she has maybe 80% retained everything back, but she, she still has a while to go. Um, and then homelessness for the first time ever when this happened in 2017 i lived on my own i lived out of the home like and i haven't lived with family my entire life but um 
when I did, it was always with roommates or other friends or acquaintances or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the first time I moved out on my own and it was a big step. So when you live this kind of lifestyle, you tailor fit your life to adhere to these bad habits. So the challenges are hurt everywhere. Every aspect of your life, you know, has to be changed, root and stem. So, um, you know, there's there's echoes of it everywhere in my life today. And there will be for the rest of my life echoes of it somewhere. Just the same as if I asked you, uh, hey, within the last 15 years, take a 10 year chunk of your life. And I I guarantee you're going to have echoes of that. It's not just Mm -hmm. about it being, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just the lifestyle itself became embedded into who I am. And that's just what it is. Um, So, yeah, it became very challenging. Very, very challenging. And like out of all the challenges, well, I'm I'm sure you've learned a lot of lessons, but what's like one of the biggest lessons that you learned out of like all the things that you've gone through and like, what, what are some insights that, you know, you would give us, um, you could provide us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it, it, it's not a, it's not a crazy question to ask because on one hand I, I'm a, you know, a, a peer specialist so mm-hmm. I can give advice to other uh, people in recovery, but mm-hmm. I can also give advice to people outside of recovery as well, mm-hmm. because, because, you know, living this lifestyle, it, it, it shows us those of us going through it. I mean, um, we, we live on primal basic instincts. We live on, basic survival instincts in a modern world granted we don't have to necessarily go hunting and you know hunter hunter gathering you know Mm -hmm. uh but in a way we kind of do um we go hunt for you know like when i was out thieving that was me hunting and then when i went to go pick up my drugs that was me gathering you know um i you know am very much on alert for threats threats to me at the time being cops you know um and you you just you learn at on a most primal level who you are and through that um you learn who others are and and that's a connection that only people struggling so much like that in that way would understand people that have a pampered life a comfortable life Mm -hmm. i mean good for them (laughs) but you know they're not going to understand that and so through that lens you know there there's a lot of advice to provide one of those things being um first thing that came to mind is is just baby steps is Mm -hmm. just is just taking things one one moment at a time one moment at a time and not overwhelming yourself and then just staying true to yourself Mm -hmm. which in a way they kind of piggyback off of one another but but uh by staying true to yourself i what i mean really really is trust your intuition Mm -hmm. that's that's what i mean by that um your intuition nine times out of ten is going to be right it's designed that way uh living on such a primal kind of you know lifestyle i guess to use the word again but um but living with such a primal lifestyle you know you learn that and it's you know you what i mean by that is you you learn to trust your instinct you know and i doubted my instinct often 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 and every time i did something bad would happen, you know, and, you know, it's not right every time, but Mm -hmm. 
but you, you learn, you know, you learn over time to know what the right answer is. What's the difference between right and wrong? Well, that's one of the age old questions, <laughs> but uh, what's the difference between right and wrong? The answer to that question is, you know, mm-hmm. you know you know what it is. And I, I can't say what that is. Only you can say what that is, but you know what it is. And even if it's wrong to me and it's right to you, it's the right answer. I love that. You're, it's like, uh, I wanted to to circle back to what you were saying. Like, it's a very, you're absolutely right. Like those primal instincts of like hunting hunting and gathering and being on mm-hmm. alert in our current like age like it's it's hard to really physically see the way that that plays out but it gets translated to so many different areas of our lives in this case um from your experience it, it was more of like you know it it's very solidified right like it's mm-hmm. a very um straightforward type of relationship right but even even for those that like maybe haven't gone through some of those intense experiences there is like aspects of it we go out and we we hunt and oh, we, for like, sure. and we we gather um you know like you know uh i would say information um yeah, yeah. you know connections etc 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 but yeah i mean it's and it's very hard to figure out where those where those the those instinctual parts are and then yeah. identify it and then if it's not suiting what your goals are what type of life lifestyle you want to lead identifying and then challenging it so that you can make those changes like as that's tough like it's it's very but I love that. Yes, like you know, listen to your intuition because you're absolutely right. There, like we, you know what's right for you and what's not, and only you can know that. Um. Ooh, uh. Hmm. I was gonna ask, were you always a creative person? But we we talked about that already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um. Well. My last, the last thing before, like, we wrap up, um, Verum, like, I was going to ask you, is creativity valuable? And if so, how is that valuable to you? Or how do you perceive creativity to be of value? Uh, yeah, it's, it's extremely valuable. Um, and you know, and it's, it's, it's valuable in different ways. Um, value is an interesting word as it is because sort of like insight, you know, things are valuable to different people for different reasons, uh, at different values. And, and much like anything else, there's an economy there. And so, I did this thought piece a while back about um, like karma, the karma economy and um, played on the word, like pay attention, right? Um, The more attention you pay and then like, that's an investment and then time, all these things being kind of part of that economy. And I think that creativity you know, has its own economy as well. And there's different kinds of creativity. There's, there's straight up art, you know, and then art in its different mediums. And then there's, there's creativity in a business sense, you know, like what's the best idea that I can think of in a marketing sense, uh, you know, um, but most of these things, you know, these different avenues of creativity, they're all going to circle back around to some form of storytelling. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and for me, that's who we are, uh, humans. Mm-hmm. And this is through my experience of, you know, I, I try to take these 10 to 15 years of, of drug use. And I try my best to learn from them because otherwise they're in vain. 
and you know the people I've lost will be in vain. So I I, I learn from them, and some of those primal instincts are what I learned about the most. Uh, you know, about halfway through, when you know five six years in, I'd already been to rehab once, and I, I remember being consciously aware of my situation and and knowing that this i don't know like knowing that this wasn't going to last forever because i i would not allow it to last forever and knowing that it was kind of a unique time you know just like you might just like you might think about college you know your junior year college year and you're just like man, I should really appreciate this. It's not, you know, it's not going to last forever. And you might think like, why would that kind of mentality come when you're a drug addict? But it's like, there were valuable lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. And, and I knew that. And I knew that I wasn't going to be a drug addict forever. So I, I kind of went from learning these lessons by proxy to consciously paying attention to my surroundings, consciously studying human behaviors and such. So that is why I'm a little bit more aware of these things because I wanted to make the most of it. And that's why when I had the chance to become a peer specialist, I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I was training myself to do these past few years, you know? So um, I'm getting, it does answer your question. I promise. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's fine but um <laughs> you know learning these primal sort of survivor instincts and such learning what i did learn um it just opened my eyes to who we are on a basic level and then who i am and what role i play um it's the same kind of epiphany somebody might have if they you know ingested dmt or ayahuasca or something like i had a very similar epiphany and uh you know spirituality plays a huge role in that and you cannot recover to anybody who might be struggling out there that can hear this you cannot recover without a spiritual revolution of some mm -hmm. sort of some sort you just you can't because you're in a current state and things aren't working. Things are chaotic. Things are not working. It's impossible for you to fix those things without having a spiritual revolution. Uh, you might change some things, but you will not solve them uh, without that spiritual revolution. So my spiritual revolution led me to these epiphanies, led me to my understanding of what my purpose is and shit. So my point is the vagabond concept of the creative wandering spirit. That's who we are. We are migration. Uh, we are migratory creatures mm -hmm. and we are storytellers. Those are just what we are. We move around and we tell stories because that's how we communicate from generation to generation, mm -hmm. the rights and the wrongs. So for me, creativity is so valuable that it is, intertwined with spirituality and it is entwined to who we are as a race as a species so it is very valuable to answer your question i love that like we're storytellers you're absolutely right like how can we and it 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 makes me it, it like it makes me even think like the only way that you and I can connect, the only way that we can connect with our families, with our friends is through those storytellings, using our perspectives, our experiences to connect with one another. Um, and like you were mentioning, like spirituality, it's so important. You're absolutely right for just transformational stuff, even to just walk on this earth. You have to you have to be creative to just period exist. My yeah. my opinion, <laughs> you yeah. have to get really creative to to just exist. Yeah. And I think part of the big process of creativity is that spirituality is connecting with something bigger than ourselves because there is 
the universe outside of ourselves. There is yeah. so many things outside of ourselves. And like you mentioned, like spirituality, it's it's important to just be able to do any type of transformation, any meaningful transformation in your life that will help you that will just make you your life feel better like make you feel better be able to yeah. live with that, you whatever you got <laughs> you got going on in there you know right. it's um, how you grow it's how you grow it's it's important it's important to to fail it's important to to just oh yeah it, and creativity is it's so related to failure like i've learned that it's so related to failure mm-hmm. where oh, yeah the only way you can get creative is when you see where it didn't work and then how are you going to approach it again? And yeah, so- absolutely. No, you're right. And that's why we tell the stories because mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you the story about how I fucked up so that you don't, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm here doing. You know, I'm, I'm telling the stories of my failures so that you might see success, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I love that. And, and, like I mentioned, like we got to wrap up, but I appreciate you coming on and sharing that story. And hopefully, you know, if um, I, I would love to have you back at some point as well, so we can continue um, having this awesome conversation and just keeping keeping track on like how things are going and how else we can um, collaborate and, and support each other in, in, in that um, journey. Awesome. But yeah, like, um I love this conversation. I think that it's so <laughs> having that creative outlet for somebody who is going through recovery and going through some challenges in their life just period whether it's drug or not having that expression that creative expression it's so important. Um oh, yeah. But yeah, thank you Veron for joining me. Um thank you all the listeners for listening today. Um appreciate you all again thank you so much for joining me Viram. yeah i'm happy to be here thanks for giving me the time and space to to share my story i hope that you know somebody hears it and somebody mm-hmm. is you know enlightened some way or the other and uh you know if, if you like some of the stuff i'm saying come check out my show you know i, I talk about it all the time uh I got a lot. Of, I got a lot going on. Got a lot of spinning plates, and um, For I'm sure. on social media as well. So uh, I hope that I can reach somebody. And and if not, at the very least, thank you for having me on the show and and listening to me go on and on about it. So <laughs> no, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Um, definitely, I'm leaving all your social media links and everything to um uh to your stuff um in the show notes so please check that out and and reach out um but thanks again everybody for listening i hope you have an amazing rest of your day stay creative take care